So uh, tell us your name and what you're known for. Uh, Peter Cooper, um, avoiding interview questions. <laughs> um, I've been doing Spy vs. Spy for 16 years. I did a book called The System and uh, Adaptation of Kafka and a few other things. Yeah. You do covers for The New Yorker? Now uh, the New Yorker, no, but uh, Time Magazine and Art. Newsweek and a lot, a lot of illustration work also. And, um, um, you know, a cross-section of things, which is what generally uh, is called for for continuing to have a career in art. <laughs> How'd you uh, get started in comics? I was always really interested in comics, and the first comic convention I went to was in 1970 in uh, Detroit, and uh, in one way or another I've been coming since then. And uh, did a fanzine, and uh, I just found... I, Comics just always seem to be the most interesting art form, and that hasn't changed. Uh, how about your first comics? Uh, how did you get into the industry? Um, some of my earliest work was inking Richie Rich. Uh, when I first came to New York, um, I came to be an animator I mean, when I was 18, and uh, you know I figured I could just paint blue backgrounds on animation cells, and I didn't need much talent for that, and um, that didn't happen. That, job fell through and um, so I approached Harvey because I thought that might be an area I could get into and I did samples for several weeks and then um, got a job making something like eight dollars a page. <laughs> My first page took me a day and a half. <laughs> like okay not a career move. Um, but then I, I had just I knew a lot of people in comics and I I ended up working as an assistant to uh, Howard Chaikin, who was a comic artist, and I was in a studio. His studio had Walt Simonson and Frank Miller and Jim Starlin. Frank Miller was just starting then, um, and um, and then I found that I actually was really interested in much more alternative comics. The mainstream was less and less interesting to me, and uh, I started publishing a magazine called World War III Illustrated. Where that allowed me to do more political, personal, whatever kind of comics, comics about dreams, you know, things. And um, the at that point in time, which was 1980, there wasn't the underground comic scene had, had pretty much collapsed, and so waiting around for somebody else to you know give us employment, it seemed like it would be a long wait, and so that's why we started self-publishing and coming out of fanzines. It wasn't completely crazy to say, yeah, we're just going to self-publish. And um, we're on our, let's say it's our 30th anniversary. Uh, we, we just passed, and um, we're still publishing it. Yeah, that's great. That You don't see that much anymore. Yeah, it's one of those weird things, you know. And my friend who I co-founded it with, we've been friends since first grade and into comics together almost that long. And so... We started doing fanzines together, and then we started did World War III, and we're both still in comics. And so the whole thing is absurd. But how, how many issues did it run? Has, has it run so far? Uh, I, think we're, we're, I think we're working on 42 now. So it's on semi-annual, basically. Yeah. How, how long were you working in uh, Chaikin's studio? Uh, let's see. I think it was three years actually. Uh -huh. When I was in art school, I worked. I worked in the studio. You know, lowly assistant work, but. I needed to get my chops together. I really came unprepared, and so it was a good chance to work with magic markers and paint and things like that, and um, uh, and and be around comics all the time, and and around illustration also. And um, I, I it, it, the possibility that there were other worlds outside of comics like illustration, but then comics always remained the most important thing to me. And uh, in the 80s and 90s as well, it wasn't even it wasn't a particularly good choice because you couldn't get comics into bookstores for the most part, and it was mostly like you do them for the kind of thing I wanted to do. You do them, and then a very you have a small audience, very little pay. It was you know almost hobby-like that way, but um, I never thought that they weren't the most interesting thing to work on, and so I kept on doing them. And I think a lot of the people that were in the field, especially at that time period, were just compelled to do it. They couldn't, like, not do it. And I could not avoid comics. It was just too much 
part of my DNA. If you cut me, I bleed little little panels. <laughs> were you were you getting paid at, at that time? Work, working in the uh, when when you first got started, you you were getting paid. But did, did you have other jobs or? Well, I was doing. I, I did the. Um, you know, I was inking Richie Rich and working for Shaken, and they were both paying similarly horrible rates, mm -hmm. which were you know barely enough to live on. But then I did some little bits of illustration, and then I, I managed to get my foot in the door with heavy metal, and I started working for them, and I worked for them for maybe 20 years, you know, just on and off, maybe doing work, and uh, doing things for small underground comics, and you know, it's one of those like for anybody, I just I had a Real scatter, you know, a scatter shot approach, um, and I just did lots and lots of work, and then I got my foot in the door in the, at the New York Times, actually, right when I was getting out of art school, and right when I stopped working for for Chaikin in about 1982, I started selling my first newspaper illustrations, and that opened a whole new world of like, wow, you can do an illustration and it pays the same as a whole comic book, only it takes you know like a half hour as opposed to you know a month. Uh -huh. And uh, or six months, um, and uh, so I was able to juggle between the two of those and do so. And I and I love illustration. I mean, that's a it's a whole other area. It wasn't like oh well, I'll do that you know to make money and I'll do this over here. I like I found them all kind of interesting. And over time, I also wanted to bring my political sensibilities into all those worlds and I was able to do that with a lot of the illustration work allowed me to do a lot of political illustration so that was really good. Yeah. You, you kind of blew through a lot of stuff so you, you were getting your uh, education while you were working in the, these studios yes. and it was an art education. I went to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn it's a, it's a really good art school the, the, all the teachers for the most part discouraged me from doing comics they're like <laughs> why are you doing this? Which you know was typical. Yeah. That was, I mean, which of course made it even in a certain way better because it's like, you know, I felt like Sarah Connor. I was like, <laughs> robots are going to take over the world. I know it, and it's true if you look around. Um, so you know, going into a field where you're being told it's not even an art form, mm -hmm. and being and knowing absolutely how wrong everybody is, prepares you for the like series of. Uh, blows of failure that will come along where you basically at one point or another being told what you're doing isn't working and that just it's the nature of of doing it it's like I, I now teach comics and illustration okay and you know I think one of the biggest lessons I try to teach students is that they have to be prepared for failure like failure will sit on your shoulder the whole time and those that can't deal with all the no's that will come their way are the ones that are not going to make it. And that a lot of people make it who are not absolutely great quality, but they can deal with the failure part. And they yet, you know, they just keep persevere. And, you know, you just can't, you know, I can't say enough about how often you hear that no. Yeah. And, you know, with, and that happens with the, you know, greatest cartoonists, you know, out there that they'll, Jules Pfeiffer, is you know sort of my go-to guy for you know talking to when I've had my biggest failures you know where I had a brush with Hollywood and came dangerously close to having an HBO show and and then have it all collapse and I go to him and he's like oh yeah well you know I mean essentially as Woody Allen said as you move up you get turned down by a higher class of women <laughs> so it's kind of that that's the vibe of it it's like wow you know, I got turned down by the big people. Now. <laughs> so, yeah, that's just part of the deal. Yeah, have, having that art background, how how did that influence the comics that you were doing? Uh, it was hugely important, and I, you know, it's you don't have to go to school, but you have to have some outside influence besides comics. Because the problem with comics, and the reason why I found I was less interested in them, is that they. They're like zombies, you know. They, they, you know, they're constantly going brains and eating the previous <laughs> creator's work, and all they regurgitate is more zombies, <laughs> and that, that look like that last one. And so, it, it just ends up being this this incredibly incestuous form. And so, you need to have outside influence. And for me, one of the big influences was going traveling, 
I would draw in my sketchbook and I would be looking at, you know, masks, African masks and, and so-called primitive art and uh, all sorts of, you know, and just drawing from life and having experiences that I could bring into the work, color sense that came from actually drawing what I saw outside and, um, and then also German Expressionism and a whole series of things and also going back to earlier comics, like the comic strips and finding like the source material for a lot of the work that came after. And that is also a really big thing that I push in, in uh, my classes is that the people that seem to do well are the ones that are conscious of history and that, you know, here's the case, you don't want history to repeat itself, you just want to be aware of it. And so that you know that, you know, what has come before. And some of those early comics by Windsor McKay and there's a show by a guy named Lionel Feininger, who I don't know if you've ever heard of, but brilliant Bauhaus artist, uh, futurist and cubist and all, a whole bunch of different things, ists. Uh, he did a short run comic strip that is one of the most innovative comics I may have ever seen. And he did probably 10 of them in his whole career. And they were just dropped dead amazing. And you know, to find these kinds of things that are you know, really early source material, and the reason why they're so great is because he looked at a whole lot of other art that wasn't comics. He didn't have that as a, as a reference point. And he just, you're generally speaking, I don't think couldn't do much new if your reference point is, is comics. And that, to, you know, so, and there's so much to look at that are related to comics in, in different ways. You know, there, there's things that these the people do in, in film, certainly, but, you know, in literature and, you know, and I mean, there's just so many areas and it's expand, it's always expanding. And the ways that you can use comics and, and uh, use that medium and then branch out into other areas maybe adding sound, maybe, you know, the way that things are going with the internet, for example, that, that you know, a little bit of movement goes a long ways, and the way you might read something that you might direct somebody's eye that isn't going to be strictly the way it sits on the page. But that's just part of it. I love the way it sits on the page, too, and working within that as well. As, and, and that, there's just so much to explore that I don't have enough time to do it. You're dabbling in so many different things, you know, with the comics and the illustration and, and teaching, which I wasn't aware of. Do, do any of these feel like a day job versus, you know, or, or do you find a love in all of them, you know? Um, at some point,